with me in the biblical text to the book of Acts. We are uh, going to spend the next couple of weeks just talking and continuing to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit and what I hope it in- means for our lives. And uh, Pentecost Sunday uh, was last Sunday, and uh, certainly as a church bathed in the Pentecostal tradition, uh, I would not want to just run by Pentecost with just one message, praise God. I think it's worth, you know, giving a little bit more attention to it. And uh, certainly we hope that you are imagining that the power of God's Spirit that has been made available to all of us is uh, not just limited to a single Sunday celebration or certainly not even just a, a, a opportunity to, uh, you know, that dibble and dabble in something that should be a permanent expression in our lives. But uh, hopefully we can lean into what does it mean to be people of Pentecost. Uh, The book of Acts is where our text will come from today. Uh, If you are new to the book of Acts, if this is your first time hearing a little bit about this particular uh, letter, this particular uh, historical recounting uh, as told, by Paul to the writer named the uh, Luke uh, to a Greek, uh, it appears to be a, a brother by the name of Theophilus who was likely a highly placed aristocrat in the Greek culture. Uh, he was someone who was literally seeking uh, what Paul uh, or what Luke says was the greatest account of the gospel written to date. Luke was uh, very humble, I suppose, in his own uh, description of what he was contributing. Uh, I don't know if you're supposed to toot your own horn about what you create or let other people say it, but Luke said there is no greater excellent account of what happened between or with uh, regards to Jesus and certainly that uh, season and time of the apostles and And so Luke is uh, one of these writers who we are appreciative because Luke gave us both the gospel uh, and he then gave us the recounting of the first uh, years, if you will, immediate years uh, after Jesus' ascension. Here you find uh, between the book of Luke, the gospel according to Luke, and the book of Acts, probably about 30 years worth of, of, of history of the early expansion of the church into the Roman Empire, into the regional territories uh, outside the city of Jerusalem, outside the early biblical holy lands, if you will. And you also are afforded a great opportunity to see the, the controversies throughout the book of Acts that emerged. How many of you know that you can be a follower of Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost, and still have controversy? Amen. Some of y'all be like, yeah, I've been in church my whole life, and I've seen it for myself. That uh, just because one claims to be full of the Holy Ghost, it does not mean that your humanity or that our differences don't uh, at times seep through. That there is this powerful, powerful expression of what does it mean to continue to commit oneself to following Jesus well and being at peace with everyone. Amen. And not being someone who is overly contentious in our relationships, and dare I say, who is a lover of conflict, even as that conflict seeps out into our public and our social life. And dare I even say, uh, conflict at its highest form in our communities results in lethal conflicts between community members, between family members, uh, between nations. And that if we are going to be a people of peace, we must be people of peace first within our own human relationships. It's worth saying, certainly, that uh, it has been terribly disheartening and disappointing to see how individuals such as P. Diddy and, and, and others, uh, even in the, 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 the rap beef happening with Kendrick and Drake, you know, they... They, they both had some, some really great and interesting rap responses to one another, but throughout their raps, you know, there was charges of pedophilia being flung, charges of domestic abuse being flung on top of some hot beats, and we were celebrating it all. 
And it has made me ask myself, what is it about we as a culture that all we need is a hot beat to celebrate or to at least turn our eye away from the kind of violence that is too often interpersonally showing up? Uh, to all those who certainly are being triggered in, in honor of uh, Mental Health Awareness Month by these kinds of uh, celebratory or even uh, at this time moments of accountability. I want to invite you to certainly do what you need to to seek out some support and some support groups, but know that you have a pastor and a congregation that has zero tolerance for men hitting on women. And, and dare I even say women hitting on men. Everybody should keep their hands to themselves. Somebody say amen. I heard somebody say, oh, but Pastor, you know, uh, uh, she hit me first. And I said, man, what are you, five years old? What are you talking about? She hit you first. Amen. Like, God's giving you two feet as well. And those two feet can be used for you to walk away. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell them it's all right to walk away. Amen. It's all right to not be caught up in physical violence. Amen. There is no kind of love that is true and healthy that gives license for people to harm one another. There's no kind of patriotic love that gives you license to wipe out people because you are patriotic. There's no kind of hood love that allows you to feel like there's no kind of love. And aren't we people who should be operating out of love? Amen. Amen. And so brothers, sisters, if you have these these issues with your hands and your anger and your temper, the best thing you can do is go get some therapy and some counseling and some support. Because I'm telling you, if you keep hitting on folk, you're going to end up in jail. And we'll come visit you, praise God. <laughs> Amen. But you, that's just where you have to be. You're going to have to be on time out. And, uh, and we'll put some money on your books, maybe, perhaps. <laughs> Amen. But what we're not going to do is allow these things to happen and we not at least say something. Amen. Amen. We are a people who want to be involved in uh, healing and, and making things right. And let's then turn our attention to Acts chapter number one, verse uh, chapter number one, verse number one, 11 verses. Our text is going to come from, I'm sorry, it's eight verses, I believe. Our text is going to come from verse number eight, but I'll give you some background here. In my former book, Theophilus, again, Paul, why well, I keep saying Paul, Luke, amen, is writing this letter to Theophilus. Uh, uh, Luke uh, is, could be considered Acts, uh, the prelude, or Acts could be considered Luke part two. Either way, the gospel writer is writing, and he says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. And after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Verse number three, and after... Jesus suffering, he presented himself to the apostles and gave them many convincing proofs that he was still alive. Jesus appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, while Jesus was eating with the disciples, Jesus gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Everybody say wait. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Verse number five, for John baptized with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord... Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends 
of the earth. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. All right, we're going to talk a little bit uh, from the topic today. Uh, simply, there's power in your waiting. There's power in your waiting. Let's pray and invite the Spirit to be present with us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for the word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you that you remind us that we should not live by bread alone, by the physical earthly resources, but by every word, the spiritual power that proceeds from your mouth, from your being, from your wisdom. So bless those that God are here to receive the word. Bless me, hide me behind your cross and send the anointing that makes the preaching and the teaching easy. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. What is it that you are willing to wait for? What is worth waiting in your journey through life? Is there anything that you are willing to go through a process even when the process of waiting starts to stretch you beyond your comfort zone? Are you someone who has become such a instant gratification individual that if it takes too long you are ready to jump to your contingency plan I am convinced that there are some things in life worth waiting for there are some things in life that require a process I was in South Africa a couple of weeks ago with a number of comrades and friends attending a conference on anti-apartheid. Lessons from the South African leaders, particularly against the backdrop of the current conditions of genocide. And some would describe and argue apartheid happening in Israel, Palestine, and it was a powerful gathering. I got a chance to meet several bishops who were children, uh, maybe not that young, teenagers, young adults, during the years leading up to the end of apartheid. And they were some of uh, Desmond Tutu's mentees and people that Desmond Tutu mentored and, and, and laid hands on and ordained and the World Council of Churches there in South Africa, the United Methodist Church there, even some Pentecostal churches there uh, had a very robust historical recollection of how long it took for apartheid to fall in South Africa. And it was so powerful to just sit at their feet and hear how they were willing to work for something that they may not necessarily see in their lifetime. That they were willing to do the work in between uh, the trajectory they believed would lead to a fall of apartheid, a dismantling of a theology and practice of Christianity in the South African context by the Dutch church, the Dutch Christian church that literally created a theological framework that would allow folks who attended churches to buy into the systemic and structural frameworks that allowed for apartheid rule to live throughout regions of the continent of Africa, particularly in the country of South Africa and its northern neighborly 
countries. And I was, I was moved with a lot of both conviction, but also I became a bit more re-inspired because it, it really underscored and reminded me that anything of significant historical value will likely not be done in one lifetime. That you and I must be people who are consistently reminded that we are part of God's story. And God's story begins before you got here. I know that's news for some of us because we think it all started as soon as we arrived. As soon as you popped out, it was like, the world started. But how many of you know the world did not start with your arrival? You got to tell your neighbor that. Amen. It was going on before you got here. And another newsflash, it will continue when you transition on to the other side. I was in South, uh, not South Africa, that was two weeks ago. This week I was in South Carolina. And on my way from South Carolina, I had to stop in Miami uh, to attend a funeral of a general in God's church, Bishop Stewart, who is the father of the board chair of Live Free and a super close comrade friend of ours. And uh, Bishop Stewart uh, died three weeks ago today, amen, getting ready for church and uh, was, was on his way to the house of the Lord and the Lord took him home and, 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 and just being there in this this, this first is church, which was just overflowing. Bishop Stewart's actually from Kingston, Jamaica. And, and, and so his church is just the outpost for all of the Jamaican immigrants. Last couple generations of Jamaican immigrants in Miami, they got this whole area, Miami Gardens, and I thought I was just in Jamaica, praise God. It was, it was, just, it was just rich. It was the, the, the accents, the food, the, 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 the Pentecostal fervor in that place. I said, man, I must move to Miami Gardens. <laughs> but it was hot, praise God. And so I quickly got on a flight to come on back to the cool yeah. Bay Area. Somebody say amen. Yeah. But being there yesterday for the service, 3,000 plus individuals sending Bishop home in a celebratory, worthy send-off for a general in God's, uh, God's work. And, and, and as I was sitting there, it reminded me, as it was said throughout the message uh, of his service, that the ministry of God will not end even when we die. And so I, I'm a bit consumed by this idea that God's work did not start when we arrived, and God's work will not end when we die. That God's work is historically ever folding, unfolding in the world, and the question you and I must wrestle with is, where are you, God, inviting me to plug into the work you are doing? What is my life's mission, my life's calling, my life's task? Beyond just coming to church on a Sunday, beyond paying my tithes, beyond sitting at the prayer meeting, God, is there something that you are requiring or expecting me to do? And this is a very important theme in the book of Acts because you certainly have individuals who were expecting Jesus to be a political revolutionary. Now, Jesus was politically revolutionary because when you follow Jesus with all that you got, you are going to interrupt the status quo around you. When you follow Jesus well, folk are going to be a little uncomfortable that you are so committed to the disenfranchised. You're so committed to forgiving. You're so committed to being and living sacrificially. It's going to cause folk to feel a little like, man, why are you doing all that? It don't take all of that. Anybody ever been, you know, uh, uh, made aware by someone who is uncomfortable with your ethical standards? <laughs> like, 
You not stealing made them uncomfortable. You not lying made them uncomfortable. You not puff puff passing and 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 you know being you know in and out of people's beds and you you not being a a, a wicked person made them uncomfortable. Anybody is that just a few few folk? Amen. That there is this kind of discomfort when you are living out your purpose with integrity. Jesus had a politically revolutionary impact, but Jesus was not overly consumed with overthrowing Nero, with turning the Roman Empire upside down, although that's kind of what happened. <laughs> that's why folks say, you know, Pastor Mike, you know, uh, why, why, why are you so political? I say, I, I'm not trying to be political. I'm just trying to follow Jesus. Now, you understand, when you follow Jesus well, you're going to turn over some tables and some elections, and you're going to make some uh, 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 politicians and police folk and super... You're going to make some folk feel uncomfortable. Why? Because there's too much evil in the world. In systems and structures and powers for you to follow Jesus, and everybody always are happy when they see you. Amen. I'm here to tell you, you ought to follow Jesus so well in the public space that when they see you coming, they be like, oh, Lord. <laughs> As it said in Acts, here come them Jesus people who would turn the world upside down. Lord, I, I feel like I should preach that one Sunday. Amen. Uh, anybody in here willing to turn the world upside down just by being faithful to the Lord. But yet in this text, you even found the disciples who had followed Jesus for several years, seen everything Jesus was up to. They watched Jesus be arrested. They watched Jesus be crucified. They watched Jesus literally come up out the grave and their still small imagination was preoccupied with the Roman Empire. Kind of makes sense because what I have found is that people often, people often cannot see past the material conditions of their own suffering. It's hard to think about what God's doing in eternity when your stomach is empty. It's hard to think about what God is doing across history and time when your present context is overwhelmed with hell on earth. But this is the role of the church, of God's people, is to be people of eternity that can literally stand in history and in the present and through the power of God's spirit invite creation into God's redemptive work and power in the world. Because quiet as is kept beloved, it is very difficult to see the world change if we ourselves are not a part of a change movement. Either we will be caught up in the winds of this world or we will push back against the winds through the power of God's spirit. And the disciples were literally still unclear about what God was up to. And this is the best advice that I think Jesus gives his disciples in advance of Pentecost, in advance of the change that is to happen. And dare I want to say, this may be the best advice we can give you today. That when you are in need of a radical change, there is a power in you waiting. There is a power in you not being in a rush and in a hurry, but to wait on God until God gives you what you need in order to sustain yourself across the long journey that is before you that may not necessarily be exhausted in your lifetime, but you will always be pushing in the direction of God's purposes and plans in your life and in the life of your family, the life of your community, dare I say, in the trajectory of God's world. The disciples were told very plainly, before you head out, stay here in Jerusalem. Stay here in Jerusalem and wait for the gift of the Father. 
And I want to invite you, beloved, to appreciate that waiting for the gift of the Father is a part of the process you and I must learn to trust. And if you and I can trust the process, there will be power in your waiting. Verse number four clearly says, before you get ready to try to do what I've told you to do, do not leave Jerusalem. But hang out there for a little while. Trust the process that I'm getting ready to initiate in you for a little while. Realize that you are not yet the, the empowered version of you that is necessary for this next season of your life. That there's some levels that you are about to encounter that you need a little bit more power than you have today. Anybody in here can, can acknowledge that I know that as we're moving from the spring to the summer, I need a little bit more than what I had in the spring. As I'm moving from this era of my life to the next, I need to wait for a gift that has been promised to me by God. I love these passages of scripture that remind you and I that there's power in waiting. Psalms 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait, everybody say wait. Wait for the Lord. Isaiah 40, 31 says, but they who wait for the Lord shall find their strength being renewed. They will mount up with wings like eagle. They will run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I, I call that the green energy version of waiting. You know, I got a little hybrid car, praise God. And, and my hybrid car, it, 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 it recharges itself as I go. Amen. It, 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 it recharges itself too when you plug it into the source. But it also, as I'm moving through the course of traffic, the, the car just has a regenerative battery that as I go, the battery gets recharged. Uh, how many of you know that that's how God is often in your life? You, you feel like I can't go on any longer, but God says I'm going to recharge you as you move in faith and move in belief and move in power, move in joy. You will run, but you won't get weary. You're going to get stronger as you keep running on. You will have the ability to be recharged as you go. I like Lamentations 3.25. The Lord is good to those who wait on the Lord. For those whose soul seeks him. And finally, Isaiah 30 verse 18. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. It's one thing to wait on the Lord. But how many know sometimes the Lord is waiting on you? There's power in your waiting. Sometimes the Lord is waiting on you, therefore, God exalts himself to show mercy. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for God. You ought to just pat yourself and say, I need to wait on the Lord. I need to wait on the Lord. I realize that for many of the changes that I want to see in my life, in the life of my relationships, in the life of the world, I am often waiting for God to change my situation. And God is saying, I'm waiting on you to wait for me to change you. How many things must be changed in us while the change happens in the world? My first set of questions then, beloved, is are you growing tired of waiting for God's promise? God, I'm tired of waiting. I've been waiting for a long time. My question to you then is what do you do while you wait? What do you do while you wait? Do you sit in foreboding and in despair or like, are you like the Isaiah 40 passage that says that if I wait on the Lord while God is working, God will begin to transform and change my circumstance. So while I wait, how can I grow tired of waiting when while I'm waiting, God is building you into a better you? How can you grow tired of waiting while God is turning the version of you into someone that is ready for the next season 
rather than you being a warmed over version of yourself. Who, how many know warmed over you ain't gonna cut it? Warmed over me ain't gonna cut it. I need a new me. God is trying to give you a breath of newness that causes your waiting to be a season of transformation. And in the process of waiting, can you learn something new about your God? What can God teach you about God's self while you wait? My, 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 I, I, I love the scriptures where it reminds us that the Lord's uh, 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 knowledge and word is a lamp unto our feet. Which just means that the more I learn about God, the more my way becomes illuminated. What are you learning about God today that is brightening your path? What are you learning about God today that is causing your feet to be more stable? In the midst of storm, what are you learning about God that is causing your faith to be reinforced? And dare I say even better, what are you learning about yourself? There, 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 are, there are conceptions about ourselves that we hold on to that you realize are not true until you get a fresh 360 degree analysis and inventory of yourself how many of you know that that is one of the gifts of therapy it's mental health awareness month it's good for you to see a therapist because it's good to have an external pair of eyes on your developing growing edges too much familiarity with a thing will cause you to not appreciate your gaps. And I believe that one of God's great gifts to us is God, while I am waiting, give me a revelation of who you need me to be. In this season, in this position, in this role, in this relationship, in the world, who must you need me to be? And as I become aware, this is where the second point becomes so powerful for me uh, because as I become aware of my assignment, I begin to realize that I will be need in need of more power, more spirit. I will need, as we talked about last Sunday, a second work of grace. I'm going to need something that I did not get in the first act. Now, what I got in the first act was enough to literally snatch me from eternal separation from God. I mean, if I don't get nothing else, you've got enough. Somebody say amen. But how many know that there is more that God would have you to do, beloved, than wait for eternity to have proximity with the Most High? God says that I want you to receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Why? Because there is a new assignment. There is a new uh, obstacle. There is a new trajectory that I am about to open up before you. But the power you have is not enough to get through it. The spirit you have, although you have the spirit, you need some more spirit. I wonder, beloved, have you ever asked God for more? Or are you content with what you have? Uh, anybody, anybody ever been, you know, to a family reunion and, 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 and you know, you're in there with 100 or so family members and, and they, they rationing out the food to you, praise God. I don't know, maybe Thanksgiving, you, some of you probably, I don't do family reunions to me, no, let's say Thanksgiving or anywhere where you there and there's some good food. And you, you going through the line and, and you looking at the little bit of dab here and a little bit of dab there. And you're like, man, huh? maybe it's BC Sunday after church meetings. Amen. I don't know. You feel like I just didn't get enough. And, 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 I, and my appetite wants more than what is on my plate. <laughs> but you realize that the person that's giving out the food is stingy. Mm -hmm. they, they, they seem to want to wanna hold some back for somebody else. And you're like, but what about me? 
I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. I, I, I showed up in line. I got a plate that still has room for more. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. I, I, I growing up in, in, in our house, it was six children. And, and my parents were, were very good to make sure, amen, that, you know, you, you, you got one round of food. But if you want more, then it's up to you to go and get it for yourself. Lord, I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that God is that petty and that competitive because we serve a God who majors in surplus, who majors in abundance. God never runs out, but I do believe God wants some of us to want more than what you have today. God, I want more. I want more than the circumstances that I have to endure. I want more than the kind of justice that's being meted out to my community. I want more than the little bit of joy that I can grab a hold to on a Sunday morning. I want more than this relationship limping along. I want more than my children continuing to be tossed to and fro. I want more than these seeds that I'm getting in school. I want more than just the ability to pray for five minutes and be tired. I want more than this sick body. I want more than what I have. God, give me more. Lord, have mercy. And I, I hear God saying that I can give you whatever your appetite can handle. I hear God saying if you want some more, then just keep coming back until your soul and your spirit gets fed. And I believe, child of God, that some of us are caught in a place of scarcity because we've been taught that we have enough. When God is saying, no, you need a little bit more. There's a fight that you're about to fight and you need a little bit more. There's a trial you're about to go through and you need a little bit more. That's why God told us that if you want more, then you ought to just ask and ye shall receive. Seek it and you will find. Knock on the door and it will be open to you. Do I have somebody that says I need more? I need more joy in my life. I need more peace in my mind. I need more help in my circumstance. God give me more. Shout hallelujah somebody. And this is why the disciples were told, uh, don't you go too far. Uh, you stay right there in Jerusalem. Uh, you find you a place where you can get some homies. Uh, you can get some comrades. Uh, you can get some people uh, who believe what you believe. Uh, who are willing to wait while you wait. Uh, who are willing to have faith uh, that God is not through with you yet. Uh, that there is a little bit more. Uh, there's a little bit more power. Uh, there's a little bit more strength. Uh, there's a little bit more anointing. Uh, that God wants to pour out on your life. Uh, and I'm here to tell you, beloved, uh, that when God gets to pouring, uh, you start to lose the ability uh, to control how much more uh, God will give you. Uh, God will give you absolutely more. Uh, absolutely exceedingly. Uh, abundantly. Uh, above all you can ask or think. Uh, I feel like preaching a little bit today. Uh, give your neighbor uh, a quick stare and tell him ask God for more uh, tell him ask God for more uh, whatever you think you got uh, you may think it's enough uh, but God is saying you can have more uh, you can have more justice uh, somebody holler more uh, you can have more power uh, somebody holler more uh, you can have more hope uh, somebody holler more uh, you can have more healing uh, somebody holler more uh, lift your hands and holler more, more, more. And why do you need more? Because you have been called to be a witness. You don't need more just so you can become spiritually obese. So you can have all these great spiritually overflowing gifts for your own good says you shall have more 
so you can be my representative. Ooh. Do you believe it's worth waiting for more? So every room you walk in, you have enough to represent God. I'm walking into the neighborhood and I got enough to represent God. I'm walking into the classroom and I got enough to represent God. Walking into my house, into my home, into my family, into my job, and I have enough to represent God. And not God in a spooky way. Where you start acting so weird that people think you are mentally moving beyond their realm. I'm talking about representing God in a way that is so compelling. Your integrity is so compelling. Your imagination, your contribution, your clarity, your love, your power to heal and to restore and to bring things back together are so compelling through the power of the Spirit that people are conscious that you are moving through the power of God. How many of you know you can move through God's power and never mention God at all? I like to wear my t-shirts from time to time that say, I am a child of God who speaks in tongues and slays demons and swings from the chandeliers and rolls on the floor and on a good Sunday I levitate. I like to wear those t-shirts from time to time. So everybody knows, oh, when Pastor Mike's coming, he's coming with God. But I also like to be one of these undercover, kind of secret agents of the Most High. That the only way you know I'm showing up with God is when godly things begin to happen in my presence. When systems fall, when families are reconciled, when young men begin to say, I'm no longer shooting my enemy, when young women begin to say, I no longer am going to be uh, under the thumb of this human being who's trying to sell my body out there, when, 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 when capitalists stop becoming predatory, when politicians stop lying, when warmongers fall in love with peace. I believe that is an extension of the power of God. And you will receive this power. Jesus, help me in here. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you to be these kinds of witnesses. Yes, tell them that Jesus loves them. Yes, tell them that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. Yes, tell them Jesus wants to be in a living, vibrant relationship with them. And tell them that there's power in waiting. For the world to be God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And God is going to do that through us. Stand with me, everyone, and let's prepare ourselves to pray. If you don't mind grabbing the hand of someone next to you. God, I say thank you for the person who I'm touching today, even on this day where we know and recognize that change is so difficult. It takes time. But there is power in waiting for the change that we seek. I pray, God, that you will bless the person I'm touching today. I pray that you will cause them to not grow weary while they wait. As you told the disciples to hang out in Jerusalem, find some community so they can receive power. Power from on high. Power that is external to them. Power that will fortify them. I pray, God, that you will help them to understand 
that there's power, God, that is waiting for them. I pray that the appetite of your people will grow for more of you. God, we want more of you. We want more of your anointing, more of your power, more of your strength, more of your love, more of your peace. We want more healing. We want more spirit. We want more, God, so we can be agents of reconciliation, agents of love, agents of peace, agents of kingdom of God. So bless my beloved God who I'm touching today. Give them what they need for this next season. Some of them are about to take a step into some deeper waters. God, we're asking for more. God, we're ready to move off this shallow place into a spiritual depth. And God, I need more spirit than I have today. I thank you for what you've given me, but God, I will not settle. God, I have a bigger appetite for more of you, more spirit, more power to be a witness. Now lift your hands. God, I pray now for myself. I pray for my journey. I pray for my own struggles and my own challenges. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better wife. I want to be a better partner. I want to be a better community leader. I want to be a better boss. I want to be a better, Lord God, uh, activist and organizer. I want to be a better freedom fighter. I want to be a better student. I want to be a better human being. And I know, God, that as the seasons are changing, I'm realizing that I need more of you. Not because, God, I... I don't have you. I just realized that the next step requires another elevation, another God upgrade, another accessing of the spirit that is open to me. I need another work of grace. Uh, Lord God, I need to be filled with power from on high. And so God, I receive the power. Just receive it. Say, I receive it, God. I receive power. I receive victory. I receive anointing. I receive it. I, I accept it. I, I embrace it. God, I need more and I want all of it, God. I don't want to settle. I don't want to settle. I don't want to settle for, God, a, a little when I can have all that you have for this season. God, open me up and fill my cup until it overflows God so it can run over your spirit, your power, your anointing. It can run over into my circumstances. So every step I take, I'm leaving a trail of more spirit, a trail of more power, a trail of more anointing. May it, Lord God, overflow in the name of Jesus. If you're here today and you want some more, you want some more of this fire burning. You want some more of this anointing. You want some more. Come on and let's, let's ask God, give me more together.